Networks, we are here with Matthew Hine, who is the Chief Product Officer at Radix. And we are going to talk about the Radix protocol. And Radix was launched on the mainnet on uh, 2021. The Radix mainnet was launched in the year 2021. And since then, Radix has actually seen some great growth. So I'm looking through this brochure. We are at Consensus. And Radix right now has processed over 2 million in transactions with 100% uptime, which is amazing. There's 3.5 billion XRD, which is the native token for Radix at stake. Yep. And they also have a very thriving developer community of over 9,000 developers in the ecosystem. So, Matthew, can you let us know three reasons why builders, developers, and Web3 users should be looking to um, leverage Radix for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the entire focus of Radix, going back, you know, we've been around for about eight or nine years developing, and the entire focus has always been about how do we bring the the value, the, what should be the value of DeFi and Web3 and all these new concepts that we're all excited about, how we bring them to a mainstream audience, how we make it, actually make it ready for people that aren't just in the crypto bubble, but are people who are just, you know, they want to build a great business with a competitive advantage, or they want to use something that's going to uh, give them better ownership of their own data, all these sort of things that we should have. All of the, the pieces are technically there, but right now it's unusable. If you're a developer, building on most smart contract platforms is a very, very high bar of entry, and so it's basically impractical. You're going to spend a lot of time, and you're going to be building something which is easily exploited because it's just too complicated. If you're a user, right now you have to onboard into this wallet where you have to write down a seed phrase and all this kind of stuff. People don't get it. So the reasons why basically people are already coming to Radix, and if you look around a booth here, we're, we've got a bunch of uh, projects that are going to be launching. Uh, we have a couple of DEXs here, and we also have some other projects uh, right here. You know, there is a communications protocol, Hermes pro communication protocol right in front of me. Exactly. Pretty good thriving ecosystem. Right, and this is and this is all essentially before pre-launch. So even though our mainnet has been live, like you said, since 2021, our smart contract capability goes live in a few months. Even because even with us being pre-smart contract, we have this whole ecosystem of developers. They're saying we want to be first in line. We want to build here because not because you've got the biggest grants program or because your token price is whatever. They're here because the tool set is better. Um, they're here because they feel like they can actually build a better application with a better user experience. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've just really put all of our effort into giving them the tools that they need to be able to do that. And that's great. So guys, you know, if you're a builder looking to build on a Radix, Radix actually uses a language which is a derivative of Rust. So if you have built on Solana, Solana uses Rust as their language to uh, you know build on top of Solana. And Radix uses uh, it's crypto, is that the language? Yeah, we call it scripto, yeah. So it's heavily based on Rust, yeah. Um, it is, it's going to be quite different than your building experience on Solana. So what we did with scripto is take the basic good syntax of Rust, but what was missing from basically every other L1 was asset-oriented syntax. And what I mean by that is, if you're building anything in Web3 or DeFi, everything you're building is fundamentally about ownership of assets. It's about, um, you know, owning your own NFTs and having those have meaning, or using tokens and swapping them, connecting different, different applications together. That's the reason why you build on one of these application protocols. And so we've built our environment to understand those things natively. When you issue a token on Radix, you're not, you're not creating an ERC-20 contract. You're actually telling the platform, this is the token that I want, these are the behaviors I want that token to have, and it's managed at a protocol level. What that means with Scripto is we can, we can layer on very specific syntax on top of the base Rust syntax that's about manipulating assets. So for example, if you're writing a decentralized exchange on Radix, you're not having to write a bunch of complicated calls, the ERC-20 contracts, and making sure that you've got the right returns, and double checking for re-entrancy, and all these sorts of things. You literally can write logic that thinks that is the way in which you think about the problem. Tokens come in, you do a little bit of math, tokens go out. In fact, a decentralized decentralized exchange is literally like the second tutorial we run people through. If you're building crypto, we do hello token, very easy, and then the second thing you do is, is a decentralized exchange because it's that easy and direct. And it should be because the concept is simple. Why shouldn't the code be simple? Absolutely. I do have a couple of questions, right? Especially yeah. here, we are, I'm looking at this little booklet here, and the first thing I see on there is the Radix wallet. Yes. And it says user experience right down there. We, you did talk about things like, hey, you know, you have to write down seed phrases. Right. Or a good, 
I don't know if it's a good alternative, but an alternative to not doing that is generally going to be a custodial wallet, right? It's not a self-custody wallet. Right. Which, so with Radix, how is that being enhanced? Yeah, so we want to we wanna stay away from the custodial wallet because fundamentally, once you're trusting your assets to someone else, you haven't really changed anything. You're basically back to the traditional banking system. You end up with FTX, yes. where you have someone who's like, you trusted them, but actually they weren't very really trustworthy. One of the really the, the superpowers of Web3 should be able to the fact that you can control your own assets. However, what we can't do is ask people to give up the convenience and the familiarity that they already have with interacting with these systems. So part of that is the fact that if you have any bank account, you have a multi-factor system here whereby, you know, I have a password that I can log with, but if I forget that password, I have a way of recovering access to my funds. I'm not locked out. It's not as if like the bank gives you a seed phrase and if you lose that seed phrase, sorry, yeah, you can't no, touch your money anymore. That, that's how guys, some of the Bitcoin and Ethereum is actually locked Exactly. exactly. It, yeah, it's never going to go anywhere because people have lost access to their wallet. Exactly. Billions of dollars have been lost that way. So on Radix, we built features into the account structure on our ledger has multi-factor authentication built into it, which means that we can do social recovery, we can do multi-factor recovery, we can have you be able to sign transactions with your phone, but if you lose your phone, it's okay. You can use other factors to recover access to your accounts. Really powerful system and allows us to deliver a mainstream ready user experience with our wallet that we couldn't do if we hadn't built these features in the platform. It's not just about the wallet, it's about the entire platform. Got it. And uh, is Radix a platform for enterprises to build on? And by that, what I mean is how much time does it take to achieve consensus and how much time does it take for a transaction to get finalized? Well, yeah. So a couple of different questions. I mean, so we've got very fast finality. It's, you know, a couple of seconds basically for finality. So this is, we've got a BFT based consensus algorithm for those who know what that means. Um, but very, very fast finality. It's not probabilistic finality. The Byzantine fault tolerance protocol. Exactly. Like Panera, they have the asynchronous Byzantine. Yeah, theirs is a little bit different, but same kind of family of consensus mechanisms, I would say. But ours is proof of stake, is our civil protection mechanism. So it is a, uh, unlike Panera, it is a decentralized network. It's entirely run by community node runners. We don't run the network. We don't have any permissioning of it. Um, our next release after the... Do you have a delegated proof of stake model or is it just... Well, by the way, guys, yeah. you know, a delegated proof of stake model is something you could see in some layers where they still have a decentralized permissionless uh, protocol running, but then there are a certain number of leader nodes that are actually uh, finalizing the... Not finalizing, but they are the ones creating the block, essentially. So that's what a delegated proof of stake protocol stands for. That's right. How is... Uh, yeah. How is Radix structured? Yeah, so delegate proof of stake is a basically it's your civil protection mechanism. Like, how do you select who is able to, like you said, commit blocks and that sort of things? So we do use delegated proof of stake for that. Um, I would say that the consensus mechanism that we use behind the delegated proof of stake is quite unique. Um, it's a custom consensus protocol that we've built. It's based on Byzantine fault tolerant concepts, but it's it's quite unique to what we're doing. And critically, it's a system that's designed with our next major release after Babylon to be highly shardable. So it's going to be a system where we can have essentially unlimited parallelism of transactions. And that's what we need. Once these systems really go mainstream, a user on one side of the world needs to be able to do transactions without interfering with someone doing transactions on the other side of the world. We have a system that will, that will allow us to do that. So guys, if you know some of the newer EVM chains, the reason why some of them are faster than Ethereum is because they do leverage sharding. And that's what we are talking about here. In the near future, even on Radix, we have some, uh, some sharding. But at this point, uh, what is the transaction per second that Radix generally achieves? Yep. So current network is doing about 50 TPS, which is not groundbreaking by any means. I mean, in our opinion, it is, it is good enough to start an ecosystem on. So if you look at Ethereum, that's doing about you know, 12 DPS. 12 to like 15, that. 16 transactions per second. That's right. what we get with exactly. Ethereum generally. So what we focused on is what we wanted to deliver first was the great developer experience, our unique smart contract language, the great user experience of the wallet, being able to see what your transactions are about, being able to see your own assets. Our, our opinion is that we needed to start by providing those solutions so we can start building an ecosystem, start solving real problems. And then once that ecosystem grows, now the next mile, next milestone after that is we go to our unlimited shardability, which essentially means we have infinite TPS. It means that as there's more demand, we can add more nodes. Yeah, so sharding, you can think of it sort of like a Docker-based architecture. So, you know, things just expand exponentially and the scalability becomes really easy without really negotiating with your performance. A couple of last questions to close on this conversation. Uh, the one question I have is, you know, again, 
when people are onboarding to Radix, now they have to learn a new language, a new flavor of right. a language. Right. How easy is it for developers to pick that? And uh, does Radix provide any support to onboard developers into the ecosystem? Yeah, really good question. I, I mean, I would say that the, the the initial reaction when we talk to developers would be like, hey, come to Radix, we've got this unique smart contract. Like The initial reaction is like, oh my God. One more I've got to learn another smart contract language. Right, exactly. So. Um, but what we found is that very, very quickly, if we if they go through the very first tutorials of it, like we always say, like, look, we understand where you're coming from, just go through this tutorial. Spend 30 minutes on it. Almost with it, without fail, developers come out and going, oh, like you're not, you, you've made it so much easier that the fact that it's a little bit different doesn't matter. It's based on Rust, so like a lot of the fundamentals of Rust carry through. If you're familiar with Rust, this is easy. Even if you're not familiar with Rust, it's not hard to pick up. But the important thing is that all of the logic you're writing is so focused on what you're trying to accomplish that a lot of the boilerplate code that they're used to writing on every other smart contract language just goes away. So, you know, even though, I mean, lines of code isn't necessarily the best measure of things, but, you know, Uniswap is about a thousand lines of code. You can build the same functionality in script on about a hundred lines. It gives you an idea of like, it is much more direct, which means that something that previously would have been difficult to build, you can pick up the language, be productive, and build something you feel much more confident in. And people, developers, that we've been talking to really, really like that. So from Radix, is there a foundation that helps support developers give out grants so they can come and build on Radix? Yeah, that's right. I didn't answer that part of the question. So we, are, we, we provide support in a number of different ways. Um, we have a developer ecosystem team, um, which we, we provide support for, for hackathons. We've got a Scripto 101 course that people can do. Um, we sponsor various events where we onboard people into Scripto and help them along. Um, and then we have just launched our first grants cohort. So actually, the people in the booth here today were the recipients of our first grants. One thing that I really like about our grants approach is that these people aren't here because we paid them. These are people that were already committed to building on the platform. We're already saying they wanted to launch on Radix because of the quality of the platform. And our job was to accelerate them. We said we took those, pro those projects that we already thought had merit on their own, and we said, how can we help you move faster? And so our foundation does help with that quite a lot. All right, thank you. And uh, my last question for you is, uh, we are talking about building things on Radix, right? But what about integrations with external factors? So one of the sure. things with Ethereum being an already established ecosystem is you have no code platforms. You have oracles that are supplying, connecting Ethereum to the outside world supplying that data that Absolutely. is important for developers to build a full-fledged enterprise application. Yes. Where is Radix in that journey? Yeah, so fortunately we've had an easy time with this. I mean, we've, we're talking to all the typical integration providers, whether it's Oracles or Bridges or all these sorts of things. You know, generally what we find is we find fans within those companies very easily. They have, they have to make their own priority decisions. Every product, every integration out there, they want to go multi-chain, but they have to set their priorities of what integrations we're going to do first. Almost, again, almost without fail, we find fans within those, com within those companies that say, like, all right, we really want to make Radix happen because we think it has so much potential. And so, you know, we just la announced Layer Zero integration, which is a really exciting partner. Um, we've got well, many more integrations coming very soon um, on our mainnet in, in July. Amazing. And I know I said, I, I lied when I said it's the last question. I have one last question for you. Yeah, especially um, he is the chief product officer, right? So one thing I wanted to ask, with Radix, right? When Radix was being built, yes. what is the vision? You know, we have a lot of uh, chains that are built around servicing certain niches. Yes. Um, now, Radix, I don't know if it was built with a vision for a certain niche or yes. whether it was just built with a vision that, hey, you know, we want to make onboarding easy. What is yes. the vision? Can you yeah, yeah. can you tell that? Such a great question. I love the answer. It, uh, it's there really is a, a vision, and, and it took us a really long time to be able to express this clearly. Um, and it basically what it comes down to is. If you talk to anybody that's working in Web3 or DeFi or even the metaverse, it's like there's this common recognition there's something of value here. And to me, it's less about sort of specific application areas than it is adding this new capability to the internet. And so I, maybe, maybe one way of expressing it is that one thing we lack in Web2 today and generally in the world today is a, is a very fundamental um, ability of having digital identity and ownership. Yeah. And so I would say that our vision is providing a platform that provides open, 
open, available digital identity and ownership for anybody who wants to build, anybody who wants to use this platform. And the great thing is, if you build a great platform for them, all of these applications become natural. We don't have to spend a bunch of effort developing specific features for GameFi or for DeFi or for NFTs or anything. These just naturally are possible. So again, if you look at the projects we have on here, it really covers a broad span because they can all use the same capabilities of the network. Amazing. Guys, again, this is Matthew Heim, the Chief Product Officer for Radix Protocol. And Radix Protocol um, has got market cap of a billion dollars already since their mainnet launch of 2021 and a thriving ecosystem. We will also have some follow-up videos showing the booth presence here and we'll talk to a couple of founders building on Radix. Matthew, thank you so much for your time thank and you. we look forward to more great news coming from the Radix ecosystem. Fantastic. Thank you.